you've probably played the game in your mind many times. If you had just one wish, what would it be? Most of us have fantasized about wishes being granted since we were children. And usually as children, uh, the answer was usually something like wanting to fly or having some kind of superpower or to be a princess for girls. Hopefully only for girls. Now probably many boys wish to be princesses too, I guess. As we grow older though, it gets more complicated, doesn't it? As we grow older, the kinds of things that we might wish for are very different than when we were children. We might wish for more money. Oh, not for greed, just to be able to care for our family more. Or maybe we might wish health for our family. That sounds like a noble wish. Maybe we might wish long life. And in times of suffering, in times of acute pain, even those things are far from our mind. In times of suffering, our wish gets very specific. The end to pain. Praying for or wishing for physical healing. Well, in the passage that we're about to examine together in 1 Kings chapter 3, we read of the only right answer. I know you probably always thought of that question, if you just had one wish, what would you wish for? Well, that's open-ended, it could be anything, and there's no right or wrong answer, fun little game to play. But from God's perspective, according to Scripture, when it comes to what we would ask of God, there is really only one perfect answer. We read of it in 1 Kings chapter 3. Join me as I read, beginning in verse 1. I want to read all the way through verse 15. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh's, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David, his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place, and Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you've kept him for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, now do according to your word. I do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has ever been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke and behold, it was a dream. And then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. 
I truly love this passage. I love the beauty of this passage. Obviously, it's beautiful because it is the Word of God, and that in and of itself is all we need to love this passage. But it's also beautiful because there's more than meets the eye in these verses. This is one of the most well-known passages of Scripture, of course, about the request of Solomon for discernment, for wisdom. But I want us to look at it very carefully and not just brush over it too quickly and think, well, Solomon asked for wisdom, God gave Solomon wisdom, and that's the end of the story. There's more to it. There's a little finer nuance than just that. So what I want to do is I want to look first at the straightforward, positive encouraging message or, or point maybe lesson of the passage and then from there I want us to take a look at the negative lesson uh, the caution if you will in the passage and finally I want to bring it all together for the ultimate point of what God would teach us in this passage so first of all the positive lessons here it is in a nutshell the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you would know true wisdom, not merely knowledge, not merely book smarts or knowing a trade or being knowledgeable about this subject or that subject, if you would have true wisdom, that is discernment of right and wrong, truly knowing what God's desire is and doing what you know to be what is righteous and good, if you would have that, you must begin with the fear of God. That means you must recognize who God is. You must see him in his perfection. You must see him in his greatness. You must see him in his attributes. You must see him as right and holy and sovereign and omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. That he is the one who has created this world. Therefore, he has the right to set the standard of what is right and what is wrong. Contrary to what the world thinks today, morality is not up for popular opinion. God has established what is right and what is wrong. Solomon's encounter with, this, with God in these verses is so important. You may not realize it, uh, but it is the first direct affirmation of God regarding Solomon's reign and rule. So for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the beginning of Solomon's reign. We heard David tell Solomon to walk in the ways of the Lord. Then he gave him some very practical matters of establishing his kingdom, what to do to certain enemies of the crown, certain enemies of the throne. And then we looked uh, over the course of a couple of weeks at chapter 2 and we saw this bloody beginning to a reign. We saw how... Solomon uh, dealt with these enemies. And I made a case that I felt like uh, well, the, the, the main lesson was that you're either for the kingdom of God or you're against it. And in the Old Testament, in the case of Solomon, the kingdom is representative of the kingdom of God on earth. But I acknowledged that is up for some debate. Because some people think that everything that Solomon is doing in systematically eliminating his opponents is not God-honoring. They think it's an example of how uh, Solomon is shown to be imperfect, how Solomon is shown to be obviously less than Christ. And so the reason that there's that kind of a, a little bit of ambiguity, what exactly is the message of chapter 2? Part of the reason for that is God hasn't said anything. We don't have any, we don't have it say, you know, and what Solomon did was good. Or, and in this he sinned against, it doesn't say any of that. It just tells us what happened. But here in chapter 3, we come to the first direct verbal affirmation of Solomon by God in which he approves of his reign. What is God feeling about the reign of Solomon so far? So what we might think of chapter 3 as, the first 15 verses, is kind of a progress report on Solomon's reign from God himself. Wouldn't you love to receive a progress report from God right now in your life? It's an interesting question to ask yourself. How would you rate? 
so what we have in this passage is a little bit of a historical context and background. Solomon marries an Egyptian princess. And then we read of these three building accomplishments. He builds his own house, he builds the house of the Lord, and he builds the wall around Jerusalem. By the way, don't take that to mean that those things happened between verse 1 the first part in verse 2. In other words, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a summary of the major building projects of Solomon. He doesn't actually build the temple until m much later in this book. So it's saying, for the most part, there's three things that he really accomplished as a builder. He built his own house, which was amazing. He built the temple, which was glorious, and he built the wall, which was obviously grand and defensive. It's a summary what is really important comes immediately following and it is a description of Solomon's worship of God. Just look at verse 3's description of Solomon. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. That's an amazing description. He is literally a man after David's own heart who is a man after God's own heart. The verse says that Solomon loved God. Do you know, and I didn't know this until I did a little research on this passage, did you know that is the only place in all of the Bible that says that someone loved God? Now, obviously, that doesn't mean that many people didn't love God, but it uses other words, you know, devoted or whatever. But that particular idea of someone explicitly loving God, this is the only verse that uh, has said that of anybody, and it's Solomon. That's an amazing statement that is... That is a unique and explicit phrase that Scripture uses to describe Solomon's single-hearted devotion to God. We have seen Solomon's political savvy. We have seen a level of his ruthlessness. He is not fearful of his enemies. Some may call that brave, some may call that foolish. Whatever it is, Solomon is determined to hold fast his kingdom. But now, we see his spiritual condition, and it is beautiful. He loves the Lord. And of course, love is more than an emotion. Solomon didn't just say, I love you, Lord. He demonstrated it. In the sacrifice, notice the second half of verse 3. He sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. But then look at verse 4. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Can you imagine the magnitude of a thousand animals? Bulls, goats, sheeps. Sheeps. Sheep. That's the plural of sheep, right? Sheep. A thousand simultaneously being consumed. Can you imagine the aroma? The sacrifice. I know he's king, but even then, a thousand animals just for the purpose of sacrifice. Think how many people that would feed. Think about the monetary worth of a thousand animals at this period in time. And he offers it. So how does that apply to us? The question for us is, is that our kind of devotion to the Lord? Do you have a Solomon-like desire to please the Lord? Whatever the cost. Do you love the Lord? If you do, then ask God to stir your heart with what the Puritans called affections, holy affections. What that means is, is, is actual outward manifestations of the inward faith that you profess. That you actually live out faith in Christ. 
Ask the Lord to give you a longing to be with Jesus. Do you treasure those times when you are in intimate relation with the Lord? In other words, your, your quiet time, we call it sometimes. The time in which you are, uh, you're with the Lord, you're in His Word, He's speaking to you through His Word, and you're speaking to Him through prayer. How often do we take that privilege for granted? That we have an audience with the Creator of the universe. So, but why don't you do a little little experiment this week. Why don't you call the White House and try to get an appointment one-on-one -on -one with the president sometime in the next six months? It's not going to happen. You probably wouldn't get an appointment with the president in all of the lifetimes of the people in this room. I don't even know if I could get an appointment with the mayor in the next week. But we're talking about the God who created all things and knows all things. And in my time with him, he has my undivided attention. That is, that is a stunning thought. I would encourage you to show your love for the Lord in practical ways, the way Solomon showed it here. To meet with God in worship often, not only in private, but publicly. Here's a quote. The way of love is both the way of self-denial and the way of ultimate joy. We deny ourselves the fleeting pleasures of sin and luxury and self-absorption in order to seek the kingdom above all things. In doing so, we bring the greatest good to others. We magnify the worth of Christ as a treasure chest of joy and we find our greatest satisfaction. Your greatest satisfaction in all of life will not come in any desire other than to give glory to God. And I know that that sounds spiritual and that sounds like, you know, well, that's what preachers say. Give me a Maserati. You know, give me a house. That'll be satisfying. But I, I've really been thinking over the last couple of days, are we ever really satisfied we get one thing and we want more and I think that's part of the way that God very gently reminds us you'll never be satisfied except in me I'm the only source of satisfaction Jesus would say I think Solomon knew this you see, it's Solomon's intimacy with God that directed and informed his request for wisdom. Worldly people, sinful people, unsaved people, we might say, don't usually ask for discernment between right and wrong. They really don't care. If they even believe there is a distinction between right and wrong, they're going to choose the wrong and call it right. But Solomon already had an established love with the Lord so that when God asked, what can I give you? He didn't have to think, oh wow, well let me think about this. I'll get back with you. He knew his heart's desire and his heart's desire was the desire of the Lord. Love the Lord with all that you are and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, if you love the Lord, his desires are your desires. He conforms your desires to his. So what could be more pleasing to the Lord than what Solomon asked? As he says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it was because he had already recognized who God is that he knew what he should ask. What would benefit 
him and glorify God most. Now how do we, how do we follow Solomon's example? Because I doubt very seriously God is going to appear to any of you in a dream tonight. We live in a new covenant era. And so what we do is study the scriptures which according to 2 Timothy 3.15 are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Do you want wisdom? Here's the wisdom. And in a way, in a very direct way, we're more blessed than Solomon who was the wisest of all time because we have the fullness of God's wisdom at our disposal at any time. You want to know what to do in any given circumstance, in any given situation? It's right here. It is right in the Word of God. We have the tool for life to live it and live it rightly to the glory of God. Seek the wisdom of God in the person of Jesus Christ. For as wise as Solomon was, the Bible says that Christ is infinitely wiser. And he is your Lord. And he lives within you. Scripture gives us that promise that if you're in Christ... The Holy Spirit is yours. He is the comforter. He is the helper. He is the interpreter of Scripture. You have wisdom at your disposal. Don't let your conscience be your guide, as Disney would have us to believe. Let Scripture be your guide. Your conscience will fail you all the time unless it is bound by Scripture. So the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's a positive lesson that we learn from this passage. But if we continue, we see other negative lessons. And it's simply this. In a nutshell, the love of self is the enemy of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The love of self is the enemy of wisdom. Now, I said in the beginning that there was more than meets the eye here. There's also a subtle but certain warning in this story, and it's not immediately apparent on a quick read-through. Because mainly what we focus on, and rightly so, as we've already been talking about, look at something I didn't mention in the positive side of it, but notice how Solomon uh, prefaces his actual request. So God says, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon says, not wisdom or long life, riches, he starts out, before he asks anything in particular, he starts out with worship, doesn't he? He starts out by saying, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you've kept him for him this, uh, for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne. You hear what he's doing in different ways, from different perspectives, different facets, but they're all saying the same thing. You're great, Lord. You're deserving, Lord. Why should you grant me anything, Lord? I could never repay you what you've already given me, much less what you would give me at this point. You were gracious to my father. You kept your covenant with him. All through the Old Testament, we see that as the point of praise of the people. You're a covenant-keeping God. You never go back on your word. You're not fickle like the false gods of the pagans. We want one thing today and another thing tomorrow. You're steadfast in your love. So he praises him. Again, I say, Solomon's love for the Lord is deep and genuine. But even for those who are lovers of Christ, 
Those who have been born again, who have redeemed, been redeemed, who have been justified, who love the Lord. You who are sitting in this place, who love to study the Word of God, who love to sing hymns to God. Imperfectly granted, but you love the Lord. Even you are in danger of loving self. And loving self is always the enemy of wisdom. For believers even, we must be very, very aware of our tendency towards sin and drifting. We must be on guard to our temptations. We must kill sin daily. We must die to self. We must take up our cross daily and follow him. Because as we're reminded in the great hymn, we are prone to wander. And if the wisest man in the world who loves God with the level of devotion that we've been describing can drift into sin, so can we. Now most people think that Solomon doesn't really turn away from the Lord until later in life. And, and that is true, and we'll see by the end of this series, by the time we get to the end of Solomon's life, it's a, it's a far cry from you are great and great, you know, he is... He's a bad man at that point. And most people think that, well, most of his life was lived in faithfulness to the Lord, and then he just kind of had a hiccup there at the end, later in life. But here's what I would argue. Full-blown sin always begins with a seed of sin. It always starts small. I've said it to you a thousand times and the reason I have is because my preacher growing up said it to me a thousand times. Sin will take you farther than you want to go and it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And what starts out as just a curiosity can become full blown before we know it. Verses 1 and 2 are the seed of sin. Look at it again. Go back to the very beginning of the chapter. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That's strike one right there. That's a seed of sin. That is not uh, meant to be a commendation of Solomon's act. From one perspective, and probably the most important perspective, when it says he took an Egyptian princess, immediately, right off the bat, we know he's unequally yoked. He has taken a wife that is not a follower of the Lord. And so when I say unequally low, I, I'm not talking, you know, ethnicities. You know, he's an Israelite and she's an Egyptian. I'm talking about spiritually, they're unequally yoked. He brings into his home someone who does not love the Lord. Please don't hear me say that lightly. Students, young people, the most important single factor in your consideration of a spouse forever in your life is this. Are they a lover of Christ? I don't care if they're the cutest boy in school, if they come from the greatest family, if they've got the most money, if he's quarterback of the team. I don't care about any of that. If he's not a believer, you will experience hell, quite literally, on earth. It will, it will ravage your life. And your children will be confused and there'll be problems. There is a reason. And part of that is, when I say don't be unequally yoked, I I'm encouraging you not to do evangelistic dating either. Well, I'm a Christian and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win them over. Listen, guys, the world will say all kinds of things are important. But we got chemistry. We got a connection. Friends, if Christ is not the foundation, you will reap the whirlwind. 
Look at David's, uh, excuse me, Solomon's life later. He goes from one Egyptian wife here in this verse to hundreds of concubines. Not to mention that he marries an Egyptian who is the antithesis, the antithesis completely to all that Israel stands for. Israel is God's chosen people. E Egypt, symbolically, think about where I'm going. I mean, that's who they came out of slavery from. Like everything that God disproves of is Egypt at this time in the Old Testament history, right? So not only are they unequally yoked, he is bringing into his home the spiritual antithesis to everything that he says about the Lord. Actions matter. Don't be merely hearers of the word, but doers also. Now, maybe he did it for love. Maybe he did it for lust. Maybe he did it for political power. Obviously, he would think that an alliance with Egypt would be beneficial to the kingdom. Whatever reason he had for doing it, it was not for the glory of God. Notice another very subtle but important warning. In that same descriptive first verse, it says that he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord. We'll see this more explicitly later, but you notice something very subtle but important. He builds his own house before the house of the Lord. Which is Haggai, later, one of the minor prophets, after the Babylonian exile, they come back into the land, read the book of Haggai, it's very short, you can read it in ten minutes. And the, the chief complaint is, why are you all living in paneled houses while the temple of God lies in ruins? So, like, maybe a modern uh, parallel, a parable, an analogy of that would be like bringing your tired, old, nasty sofa to the church and saying, here's my love gift to the church. Now, that's a kind of a, an extreme example. I'm saying, what about considering the glory of God and the people of God as of equal importance to your own material needs? We'll talk more about that tonight when we come to the last paragraph in Acts chapter 2 where we have this summary of the early church and it talks about how they have everything in common. It doesn't mean they're communists. It means that they are humbly putting the well-being of one another above their own well-being. So we'll see. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be flippant or dismissive about donations that you might make to the church. But what I'm trying to say is we don't give our second best to God. We give our best. And yet here Solomon takes care of his own house and then moves on to the temple. There's more to that. We'll talk about that as we go along in this series. One other major warning. Turn back very quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I want to kind of set the context just a little bit before we I explain to you Solomon's problem. Okay, let's start in verse 1. Deuteronomy 12, verse 1. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. Number two, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods. 
on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash them in pieces in pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make a hab his habitation there. There you shall go. And there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Back to 1 Kings chapter 3. It's a, it's a one word. It's only one word. Only. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only. See, that's an important word. Do you understand what that is communicating? It's saying the only problem was, or the exception is, so read it that way. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. His only problem was he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. High places in Old Testament, always a bad thing. Always a bad thing. Do not worship at the high places. Because the high places were those places that the pagans had built up to worship their gods. And so this is an important law that God had given them. And if you notice, after he acts, I don't want to make too much of this, but after he gets the wisdom granted, in verse 15, it says Solomon awoke and behold, it was a dream. And then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant and made and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings. So it's like after the wisdom and the discernment comes, he's like, oh, that was a mistake. And he goes to the right place, which is where the ark is, though there's no temple yet, but he goes to Jerusalem where God's chosen place of worship was. So Solomon ought not worship at the high place. So you may think, well, that's kind of odd because it's right after he makes these sacrifices at the wrong place that God comes to him, seemingly very pleased with him, and offering him whatever he wants. And I would say, precisely, God coming to Solomon with his granting of anything is an act of the grace of God, not the merit of Solomon. It's, an, it's amazing grace that God comes to Solomon in the midst of his disobedience regarding the high place. And that, that's what we sang a moment ago. He will hold me fast. You're not going to persevere in your own strength. God, Christ in us is what causes us to persevere. And in all this, kind of Solomon has the same seeds of sin as Adonijah and all those others that he did away with. Self-serving, prideful love of other things. And here's the point, friend. Solomon's problem is our problem. For many of us in this room, namely this one. He loved the Lord, but he had other loves too. Now I'm not saying you know, don't love your family and all that kind of thing, obviously. But what things compete for your loyalty to the Lord? Those other loves, when not destroyed, led him into outright, open, blatant, and gross sin later in life. It'll do the same to us. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. And it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. So the ultimate lesson, what is all, uh, wrap all this up, bring it up. So preacher, you said all this stuff about Solomon. What do I need to know when I walk out of this place and go home in just a moment? Here it is. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Don't put the cart before the horse. 
Don't try to climb the ladder of success. Don't seek after material wealth. Don't seek after power or prestige or popularity. And let those things drive you. Those earthly things cannot be your agenda. Only the kingdom of God. Notice what he did in Solomon's life. Solomon made the right choice. I choose you, Lord, in wanting to do everything that you would say is right. Help me discern right from wrong. And God said what? Because you've asked for that, I'm giving you all the other stuff too. That verse... In Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. It is in the context of a discussion about not worrying. Don't worry. If you are a child of God, he has your best interests at heart even in the darkest nights of your soul. He will hold us fast. Jesus is not going to share his glory with another. The Bible is clear that God is a jealous God. And Solomon's truth stands today. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you want a life full of joy, it can only be found in the discernment of right and wrong that only comes through Christ. He is the plumb line of righteousness. I'll just close with this. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 3 that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus. All the treasures are hidden in Jesus. And the wisdom of Christ far exceeds that of Solomon and you have Christ. You have Christ. So I wonder, do you need wisdom? you need wisdom in your relationships? Do you need wisdom in your business this morning? Do you need wisdom in your home? Do you need wisdom in health matters? I leave you with one promise. The book of James... The very first chapter of James. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And, listen to this last part, it will be given him. That is a promise. You do not have to lack wisdom if you are a follower of Christ. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for your undying and steadfast love for us. You are a good and covenant-keeping God and we thank you that you have brought us into the covenant of life for now and eternity and we Thank you for the forgiveness that you've granted us in Christ, that he's died so that we might live, that he has paid the penalty for our sins. He has suffered the wrath that we rightly deserve. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone who needs that message and needs to embrace that message this morning, Lord, I pray that they would repent and they would believe that you are the risen Christ. Lord, I pray you would grant them new life today, that this would be the beginning of eternity of learning and growing and following you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.